Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, is everyone mentally ill? So this is an interesting question. This is actually a question I've received many times in many different forms. Another popular question is how many people in the population have a mental disorder and a lot of other similar questions like that. Now, technically, the answer to that first question, is everyone mentally ill? The technical answer, of course, is no. But I'm actually going to answer this question from three different perspectives. Yes, meaning most people or almost everybody is mentally ill. No, everyone's not mentally ill. And maybe, which is kind of my take on the whole situation. So let's take a look first at the affirmative response, the yes response to this question. Behind this argument, behind the idea that everyone is mentally ill, we have a lot of different research, and it varies quite a bit. For example, we see research that indicates that 25% of people have a mental illness right at this moment. So really another way to look at that is at any given time, 25% of the population will qualify for a mental disorder as classified in the DSM. We have other research that indicates that at some point in time, so at some point during a person's lifetime, there's a 50% chance that they will develop a mental disorder. Although we have some longitudinal studies, so these are studies that look at the same people over a long period of time, that have shown that number is closer to 85%. And even at that 85% estimate, we think this is underestimated. There's a lot of people, of course, that don't want to report mental illnesses even when they're part of a study. So they may underreport or minimize certain symptoms. So this kind of moves toward this argument that everyone is mentally ill because almost everybody will have a mental illness at some point in their lives. That's one way we could look at this affirmative answer to the question. So under this theory, why do so many people not report mental illness? Under this theory that everyone has a mental illness, why is it so underreported? Well, I mentioned a couple reasons before, but what we see here is there's a stigma associated with mental illness. And it's a stigma different than we see a lot of times with other situations in life. There's a fear, a loss of employment, of being abandoned. We see misinformation about mental illness that makes people reluctant to report it. Embarrassment. And also, I think, there's condescending behavior sometimes. If somebody tells somebody else they have a mental illness, it kind of changes the power position a little because of that stigma. And somebody can feel like they're being treated in a condescending way, and sometimes they are being treated in that way. I think, too, the nature of mental illness itself is a major reason for underreporting. It's self-perpetuating with some of the disorders like OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, major depressive disorder, and almost all the personality disorders we think have a self-perpetuating component to them. So the disorder itself means that a person probably won't seek treatment or may not report that they have symptoms. Now we can also look at this from another point of view, which is one mental illness can increase the risk of another. And the best example of this is a mental disorder leading to substance use disorder. And we know that if an individual has a mental disorder, the risk of them developing a substance use disorder is much higher than if they don't have a mental disorder. And I think a lot of this risk is because there's a failure to treat that original mental disorder. Again, because the person doesn't seek treatment, or because treatment's not available, or a variety of reasons. Okay, so that's the yes answer. So, is everyone mentally ill? That would be yes, they are, or at some point they will be, or almost everybody will be at some point. So, what about the negative answer? What about answering no to that question? Well, here this leads us down a much different path. So, before I get down this path, it's important to mention that I have a PhD in counseling, I'm not a physician, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I'll be mentioning psychiatrist here, so that's why I wanted to make that distinction. So under the negative answer to the question, we see a part of this is a distrust of the DSM, a distrust specifically of psychiatrists and of big pharmaceutical companies, which we just call Big Pharma. So the idea here is that the authors of the DSM, who of course are primarily psychiatrists, are in some sort of conspiracy or arrangement, maybe an informal arrangement with Big Pharma, and they've pathologized every normal behavior. And we see this mostly, of course, with ADHD, other disorders like 
oppositional defiant disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So really this is kind of, I guess, a plausible conspiracy theory. I don't think of this as a conspiracy theory like the moon landing never happened or something like that. This is a conspiracy theory that I think a lot of people can get behind. A lot of people have a fundamental distrust of big pharma, psychiatry, and a lot of people don't trust the content in the DSM. And we do know that big pharma has been fined many times for the way they represent psychotropic medications. So there's evidence, I suppose, here of some type of conspiracy. What's more, if we look at the CEOs and COOs and VPs of these big pharmaceutical companies, do we really see evidence they understand mental illness? They may understand sales, but do they understand mental illness? And do they understand chemistry? Do they understand how these pharmaceuticals really work? I'm not sure that anyone does. I've actually talked to a number of psychiatrists about this very question, about the mechanisms behind certain medications. And some psychiatrists will go into details like neurotransmitters and binding with receptors and all that. And I understand it. I understand a lot of that. But some have just told me flat out, and I kind of appreciate this point of view, that it's really unknown. They don't really know why they work. But they can see that certain drugs tend to work 8 times out of 10 or 6 times out of 10. So through trial and error, they can get to a place where they can help people. And I kind of accept that reasoning. That makes sense to me. The chemistry behind the medications is really complex, but in a way you can still treat it scientifically and help people. Now, when we talk about Big Pharma, going back to them, I find it interesting with Big Pharma because I think this is a group that seems to be universally distrusted. I've talked to people who have taken medications and the medications have worked wonders, and largely they distrust Big Pharma. I've seen people that the medications didn't work at all or they had terrible side effects, and they, of course, distrust Big Pharma. So it's just a universal distrust. And I think it really strengthens this argument in the negative, that everyone's not mentally ill, but rather we've pathologized every normal behavior. And that's why we have what appears to be an epidemic of mental illness. In the same argument, we see specifically the DSM mentioned, and we see individuals indicate that the definitions of the disorders are broad, unclear, and the outcome of seeking treatment is always a diagnosis. Now this last one I think is a relatively good point. If somebody has a reason to go get treated and they go to a counselor or a social worker, or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, it's likely they're going to end up with a diagnosis. In terms of the definitions being broad or unclear, here I actually disagree with this. I think a better argument is that clinicians do not properly use the DSM. I've also seen the argument that the DSM is full of benign disorders, disorders that don't really affect anybody in a negative way. And here I strongly disagree as well. If you look at the DSM, if you look at the disorders in the DSM, many of them carry really severe consequences. Individuals who have these disorders can suffer potentially quite a bit. So I wouldn't refer to them as benign at all. So one last interesting point with the negative answer to the question, is everyone mentally ill? I don't really think there is a conspiracy between the psychiatrist and Big Pharma. I tend to distrust Big Pharmaceuticals as well, but overall I think that psychiatrists do a lot of good work. And I tend to like the DSM. I've mentioned this several times before in other videos. What's interesting about this particular conspiracy theory is where do counselors fit in? Everybody in this theory is making a lot of money, but counselors and other professionals related to counselors like social workers and psychologists typically don't make a lot of money. So this kind of goes against this theory that there's some massive conspiracy or even an informal conspiracy or agreement that's occurred that would promote pathologizing normal behavior. So I've explained the point of view of the affirmative and negative answer to the question, is everyone mentally ill? But of course there's a third response, which is maybe. And this is kind of my take on the situation, like I mentioned before. I can appreciate both of those arguments, but I don't think either one is completely correct. I think both have merit. There's probably truth in both arguments, but I don't see one as really having the answer. I don't see one as really breaking this question wide open and giving us an answer. Here's how I see it. I think that one of the things we've seen in society is we don't allow for normal behavior deviations or deviations in mood, emotion, or thinking anymore. 
right? Just look at a few areas of how we manage relationships or situations in our society. So if we just look at the idea of greeting somebody, like all the rules just to walk up and greet somebody. Walk up to them, don't stand too close, don't stand too far away, make good eye contact, have a firm handshake, don't forget to smile, talk a certain percentage of the time, and of course this percentage is variable depending on who you talk to, take an interest, and if you don't do all of these things, if you're not perfect, then you're not social, then something's wrong with you, you have a problem, perhaps a mental disorder. We see the same things with kids and how they're active in school. Is school natural? Is school an environment that kids should be well adapted to? If a kid is bored or fidgety or has trouble sitting in their seat, then they have an impulse control problem, right? We immediately pathologize it. Look at something like sadness. If somebody's sad or down, well, then they're bringing everyone else down and they're told to cheer up. So in our society, we're not even allowed to be sad anymore. And then we look at the issue of anxiety. Right? If somebody's anxious, people will tell them, well, there's nothing to fear. But I can fully understand performance anxiety and social anxiety and panic disorder. If someone is speaking in public or speaking in a group and they make a mistake, in some situations that could lead to problems for them. Somebody could say, well, maybe they don't get fired from their job, but maybe they're not allowed to do that anymore, whatever job they were doing. Maybe they're not allowed to present in front of people anymore. Maybe they're not really somebody that should be promoted. So yes, social anxiety and other types of anxiety, that does represent usually irrational fear, but that doesn't mean there's not some rational basis for it. And again, I think it's a lack of toleration by our society. Our society demands too much. They're asking people to drive in very narrow lines. And of course, I mean that in terms of mental health and not literally driving on the road. So my argument here is that people are not allowed to be people anymore. And maybe this is what's really leading to this perception that mental illness is everywhere. Maybe we're calling too many things mental illness and we're creating actual mental illness through this commitment to perfectionism and to some extent narcissism. If we think about narcissism and the rise of narcissism, someone who's narcissistic, which is a lot of people these days, is not empathetic. They're not open to hearing about somebody having mental health symptoms. They're not understanding. When something's out of the ordinary, that's inconvenient to somebody who's narcissistic. So they come up with a trivial explanation for the symptoms. Oh, don't worry about that. That'll go away. They dismiss people who bring symptoms to them. So from someone who's narcissistic, we don't see a lot of altruistic behavior. It's all about them. And they tend to discard people in their lives who hold them back. And that could include people who have mental illness. We can also connect narcissism, I think, very strongly to bad parenting and bad parenting can be connected, I think, relatively strongly to the development of mental illness. So we have really a society filled with a number of people, quite a few people, that just aren't effective parents. That doesn't mean there aren't good parents out there. There are. But I've seen really an astounding proportion of parents that aren't effective, that are self-centered and ignore fairly clear indications of mental health problems in children and, again, engage in behavior that I think could lead to mental health problems. So here's the way this maybe answer could break down. If we have to follow all these rules and we cannot tolerate deviations from the norm, then yes, everyone is mentally ill because that's how we've defined it. But what if the expectation is the problem? What if we're expecting too much and, because of the rise in narcissism, creating mental illness? Well, then the answer would be no. Everyone's not mentally ill. We have many people with mental illness, but everybody wouldn't be mentally ill. So it's interesting here, too, I think, that we presume when we meet somebody, the default position when you meet somebody new is that they're mentally healthy. People usually don't assume that somebody they meet has a mental disorder. But if we did assume everyone had a mental disorder, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but if we did assume that, from a statistical point of view, it would make more sense. If we look at a parallel over to the world of medicine, if somebody is with a physician for, say, 50 or 55 years, and they take their chart, say that physician retires, and they take their chart to another physician, and they hand it over to that person, that new physician, would that physician open the chart and expect to see no medical history, nothing? The person's never taken an antibiotic for anything. They've never had an injury or a surgery or anything. But with mental health, that's kind of the presumption we make. We meet somebody and we think, oh, 
they're mentally healthy by default unless other information is made available. When really, again, strictly being logical, it would make more sense to assume somebody did have a mental illness and they would have to demonstrate that they didn't. So this brings up the question, is being mentally healthy abnormal? See, what's really abnormal here? Is having a mental disorder really abnormal? Should that be called abnormal psychology, for example? Or is being mentally healthy something that makes you stand out? So back to the original question, is everyone mentally ill? I guess the only true answer I can give is I don't know. But I think it's an interesting topic and there's a lot of different points of view out there on this topic. You have different thoughts about what qualifies as normal or abnormal, or is everyone mentally ill, or does everybody have a mental disorder? Please put those thoughts in the comments. Again, I always enjoy reading those and seeing the discussion that comes about because of them. As always, I hope you found this description of mental illness and prevalence to be interesting. Thanks for watching.